open up with the word of prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for our time this afternoon. Uh, we pray that uh, as we uh, think about um, our, our struggles and our, our, our suffering that we go through, uh, as we unpack that a little bit today and, and later on with the sermon, uh, we ask, Lord, for your uh, blessing. Uh, help us to understand that. Uh, help us to be able to um, interact with uh, our, our struggles and, and, and sometimes things that we can't even handle. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, okay, so um, today we are going to pivot just a little bit. Uh, next, uh, and and uh, for the sermon, we're looking at Psalm 88. Okay, so for the sermon, we're going to look at Psalm 88. Um, and it feels like, why are we doing that when we're, uh, what happened to Acts? Uh, I'll explain during the sermon why we're doing that. Because uh, I think it connects us, Psalm 88 connects us to, um, to Acts. Uh, essentially, Acts 9, verses 3 and 4, uh, or 4 and 5, uh, when Jesus says, why, why are you persecuting me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It, it, it's kind of related to that. And so... Uh, I wanted us to kind of unpack Psalm 88 a little bit. Uh, and so today, uh, I thought we might uh, flesh out as well uh, this notion of, um, uh, you hear this a lot. Um, you hear this a lot, and, and, and I wanted to kind of pick out this statement um, and see, you know, how true is this statement? Is, is this something that we should uh, embrace, or is this a statement that we should revise in our minds? Um, and, you know, again, because lots of times we think of certain things and we think, oh, this is what the Bible is saying when, in fact, maybe it's not quite saying what we think it's saying. And the statement that I wanted for us to kind of reevaluate was, um, and, and tell me if you've heard this, God will not give you more than you can handle. Right? And, and, and this is a statement, I think, that many of us have maybe even used to encourage one another with. God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Um, I, I wanted us to think about, what, what, where does that statement come from? Right? What does that statement mean? Why do we, why do we say it? Right? And, and in terms of why we say it, I think it's most often because, again, when someone is down, right? When someone is going through a lot of adversity and, and there's hardships piled upon one after another, right? Usually, what we want to say is, "Hey, you can you can do it. You can handle it. God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Right? You're up to the challenge. You're going to get through it. Like it'll it'll be all okay." There's a lot of truth, but there's also a lot of things that are there that if you mix it in. Um, those truths sometimes can kind of become half-truths. And it, it starts to, so it sounds good, but then it, it, it can take us in a wrong direction. And, and, and we need to be really careful about that. And so that's what I wanted us to, to think about. Um, does anyone know where we get that from, this, this statement? First Corinthians 10.13. Okay. <laughs> yes. First Corinthians 10.13. Um, someone want to read that for us? Uh, let's let's turn over there. First Corinthians ten thirteen. It's actually one of those TMS verses. If anyone, if you remember what that is. Topical memory study. First Corinthians ten thirteen. Someone could read that loudly for us. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. We will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Okay, so that statement right there, right? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And that has uh, eventually morphed into this idea of um, God won't let you, you know, God won't let you go through more than what you can handle, right? And, and, and we start to say that. And so, um, and just kind of understanding that a little bit, uh, this is taken from various uh, articles, um, so I'm, you know you can look online and, and you'll find probably a ton of articles talking about this now, because um, uh, to sort of dispel some of the, some of these ideas. Well, in terms of the context of First Corinthians ten, uh, a lot of this has to do with temptation, uh, because when you think about uh, Corinth, right? Do you remember what we talked about with Corinth? We, we, we've kind of talked about this in the past. But the city of Corinth is akin to what sort of modern-day city would you think of? 
New York, San Francisco, San Francisco Las, Vegas. Las, Las Vegas, maybe not so much Las Vegas, only because it's, uh, no, no, not because of, I think, what you might be thinking. Las Vegas, because people don't really live there as much as it's a place where people come for a few days and then they leave. Um, but New York, San Francisco, maybe uh, L.A., uh, maybe a Chicago or a Boston, uh, maybe less or so with them. Uh, but definitely New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, those are three very metropolitan areas where you have an extreme sense of diversity, extreme sense of like the world, like literally the world lives there. Well, that was Corinth. Okay? Corinth was the kind of city where everybody would come and live. Um, and uh, there was a lot of, um, we'll say, w the way we think of pagans, the way we think of, uh, oh, that's a pagan culture, that's a pagan group of people. Uh, a lot of people will kind of look at Corinth in that manner. Uh, and this is the kind of church that uh, the Corinthians were. And so they were dealing with a lot of immorality. They were dealing with a lot of um, gluttony, a lot of drunkenness, a lot of uh, the kind of things that you would think, oh, um, this is why we avoid the city. right? This is why we avoid these kinds of areas. We, we'd rather uh, be in a more suburban uh, area. Okay? And so uh, you know, we, we don't want to raise our family uh, in the city, uh, we want to um, raise them, you know, come on in. Yeah, welcome. Uh, so, you know, then when the statement, when, when Paul writes this, uh, he's not so much talking about uh, tragic things happening to you and, and, and having a difficulty of being able to handle it, uh, but what he's talking about is, uh, there's always this lure to go back to these temptations. And, and that's what the Corinthian church was dealing with, to go back to these temptations of immorality, of gluttony, of drunkenness, of, of, of um, sacrificing to, to other idols, idolatry. Uh, and, and, and so what God is saying is that, look, these temptations are coming, and they can be trials, but these temptations are coming. I'm going to, um, you will always have sort of a sense of being able to come out of it. You don't have to sin. You don't have to uh, succumb to it. Uh, and it's interesting because James, right? James chapter 1, uh, verse 13 talks about uh, another sense. Um, let, me, let me go to that. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 13, uh, reading from there, says, uh, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And what's fascinating is that in, in, in James 1 right there, that, that lured, enticed, it, it's seduced. There's actually a very sexual metaphor there because verse 15 then says, if you are tempted in that way, it will conceive, it will give birth. It, it's again, this idea that God is saying, look, all these temptations exist, and, and, and you are going to be tested. The whole point is that you will refrain from uh, sinning, succumbing to those temptations. It, it has nothing to do with the, the idea of, oh, man, look at all these trials that are happening, all these uh, difficulties, all these tragic events that are happening to me. I can't handle this, uh, but God's not going to give me more than I can handle. It has nothing to do with that. What this verse is after actually talking about is we, are, we will have temptations around us all the time. Uh, we do not have to sin, however, right? The point is that we don't have to succumb to those temptations. Actually, instead, when we think about this whole notion of uh, God's not going to give me more than I can handle, right? In wanting to dispel that, the more we think that God's not going to give me more than I can handle, what does that sort of create? What, what are a couple of things that that's going to create within us? If, if we keep saying to ourselves, God's not going to give me more than I can handle. One, it assumes, right? It assumes that I just simply need to suck it up. And what it does is it creates a sense of uh, greater self-reliance. See, it, the more and more I keep being told God doesn't give me more than I can handle. What it means is, oh, then I can get through this. And what it does is it's creating a greater sense of self-reliance. You're saying that I can do this. I ought to do this. I should be able to do this. And as soon as I don't, what happens? 
it totally sets you up for failure. And it completely, what it does is it says you're a failure in that, in that regard. It says that you weren't able to do it. You weren't able to handle it. Uh, you know, there, there are countless stories of people that will say, and, and, and we have some within ourselves. But, but on the other hand, let's say we, you do get through it. You do get through it. You pulled up your bootstraps and you said, I can do it. And you did it. What does that do now? It, it, maybe not self-reliance, but what it does is it's self-glory. And it creates a sense of self-righteousness. So either on the one hand, what it's going to do is it's going to create this self-reliance. If, if, and, and if you fail, if you're unable to do it, it's going to cause you to say, well, you know, uh, such a failure I am. Or on the other hand, if you get through it, what it's going to do is it's going to cause you a great amount of self-righteousness. And you're going to say, I've done it. I've done it. And as a result, what you're going to do is you're going to look at other people who are unable to do it. You're going to look at them and you're simply going to say, you know what? I did it. Why can't you? This is not Christianity. Quite the opposite. Right? Quite the opposite. It's causing, I, I think, and so when we keep telling people, hey, you know what? God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Well, that person right now isn't exactly thinking that. This is a whole lot that they're having to deal with. And, and, and again, it might be the last thing they want to hear. It, it's actually not comforting at all. And I'm saying this as someone who has, for many years, said this to people. Hey, God said, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. And, and, and realizing, wait a minute, there's a real problem behind that. And we ought to be very careful about that. Because, in fact, and, and this is where I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 1. Let's go to verses 8 and 9. Because what in fact does God want us, or not, uh, did I say 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 8. Starting with verse 8. Um, Who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful. Is this right? Um... <coughs> Oh, sorry. I, here I am saying Second Corinthians, and I went to First Corinthians. Second um, Corinthians, chapter one, verse eight and nine. Uh, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. He went, what they experienced, the tragic experience, the affliction that they were going through went way beyond even, way beyond what they were capable of handling, right? Way beyond what they were capable of handling so that, and then verse nine, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, like death would have been better in their situation. But here's the kicker. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God puts us in a situation where actually we can't handle it. So that we might turn to the Lord, spreading spreading out our hands and saying, Lord, I can't do it. It's precisely because I can't do it. I need you, Lord, through this. But again, so often we, 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 we'll, we'll pray to God, we'll ask God, help me sort of to supplement my own strength. You know, sort of more like, almost like steroids or, or, or vitamins, right? Give me a little boost to what I'm going to do anyway. Rather than, I'm completely devoid, I, I can't do it, Lord. And, and, and that will vary between people. That will vary between people. You know, thankfully, we've had some folks uh, in, in our congregation. Um, there, there have been a few who have endured something very serious like cancer. who have gotten through it. Right. And as they've gotten through it, it's, it's, it's amazing. The, the Lord's graciousness to it. We've had others who were unable to and, and, and they've gone on to be with the Lord. Right. And, and, and we see. For some, you know, as they're going through it, they they were able to handle it. Others are literally just going to break down in the midst of that. And and they're just not going to be able to handle that. 
As a congregation, however, when we see that, as we're going through that, our, our response is, you know, if, again, if, if we're just going to tell them, well, you know what, the Lord's not going to give you more than you can handle, so um, handle your business. I, 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 it sounds mean, and I'm saying it sort of in, in, a, in a more mean fashion. I know that's not how we're saying it. We're saying it to help encourage. However, actually the point is, you're right, it is hard. You can't handle it. Let's go to God in prayer. And not just pray just to, to supplement your ability to do it, but actually, Lord, we can't do it. Can't handle it. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to come of it. Help. And, and, and that's where we're going to the Lord. Right? And so, again, Paul, to help, ultimately, here, again, that's the kicker. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. And, and, and how is God described there? Who raises the dead. Right? And absolutely, that's resurrection power. Defeating the one thing that no one, I mean, again, a Warren Buffett, a Jeff Bezos, with all the money they have, they cannot overcome death. I mean, it's to the point that people are now doing cryogenics, right? Chopping off their head, put, you know, saving it to, to download it later. I mean, they're doing anything and everything they can to try and beat death. And it's very clear, you cannot overcome death. But here, what is Paul saying? The God who raises the dead. That you will rely on the God who raises the dead. I mean, that is an incredible, powerful all-powerful God. That's what we're talking about here. That's who we're called to go to. That's who we're called to rely upon. Not upon ourselves. Upon this God. And, you know, let, let, let's go a little bit further. Let's go to chapter 12. Because ultimately what we're asking then, uh, part of what we want to know, um, and, and part of what these uh, temptations these, or, or these trials when we go through them, uh, this is what it'll do. For instance, if, if we look at First, or 2 Corinthians 12, what's very, very famous about this passage is that there was obvious something that Paul could not handle. Right? Paul could not handle something. Um, if, if we take a look, starting with um, uh, verse 5, On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should boast, uh, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears of me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Right? As far as, you know, what is that thorn? A lot of people have, have tried to describe what it is. We don't know, and I think that's kind of the point. We don't know. Whether it was a physical thing, whether it was a person, whether it was mental, um, spiritual, you know, sp we, we don't know. Um, but it's to allow us to identify with this. Uh, because it, 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 rather than just saying it has to be, only be this. So that three times, uh, verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Um, finishing it off with verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I mean, look at some of these things. Insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Some of these, you know, none of these things are things that Paul brings upon himself. And this is where we're going to get into a little bit more with Psalm 88. Those are not things that he brings upon himself. It's, it's not because he sinned. See, we're, we're tempted to say he sinned and that's why he's, going, he's getting that. Right? When you see someone going through hardships, well, it's obvious he sinned. He did this, 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 and that's why he's getting it. You know, maybe he needs to print, uh, repent. It sounds a lot like Job's friends. Right? But it's, it's, we're inclined to sort of think that. We're inclined to see someone in, you know, in difficulty, and we want to say that. Right? There, there, there's a temptation to say And, and part of that, I think, is um, increased because of the kind of society we live in today in America, particularly. Uh, sometimes people will say uh, we live in a meritocracy. 
Uh, and what that means is uh, we live in a society based upon merit. I am where I and the United States really helps push that even more. We are where we are. I am where I am because look at what I've been able to do. I've been able to accomplish this. This is where I am. You're where you are, you know, in your sad state because, well, you were lazy, right? And, and what happens is many times we, st we start to, again, a self-righteousness where we say, look at where I am, look at where you are, right? As opposed to, again, and, and, and this is where James comes in, uh, comes in as well, and Proverbs talks about this as well, where, um, Lord, may you not give me so little that I feel the need to steal, but Lord, may you not give me so much that I feel the need, where I don't have a need for you at all. Whether, you, whether you, you're, you're, you're poor or rich, the Lord describes it as, hey, you know what? They're both a temptation. They're both a situation, a temptation where you can either say, I don't need the Lord in both cases. Whether it's success or where it's not working out, right? It's something that the Lord is uh, bringing before us. And it's something that we need to uh, be very mindful of. So again, in, in coming back to this, when we start to ask ourselves with um, understanding, you know, to make us rely not upon ourselves, but upon the God who raises the dead, it's God's grace. And in, in this way, do we actually functionally rely on his grace or are we functionally relying on something else? And, and this is where I think the passage is helping us when we say, again, well, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. We need to be very careful. Uh, are we saying to rely upon the grace of God? Or are we saying rely upon what you can do? That you can get yourself out of it. Right? That's something, again, we need to really ask ourselves, what are we relying upon? And, and there can be all sorts of things. Right? And this is where we start to get into all, you know, all the idols of our hearts, and, and, and we can get into this whole other section of things. But what are we finding our comfort to help us get through what we're going through? Is it functionally, is it God's grace? The God who raises the dead? Or is it something else? Myself? And that's usually what it is. is it's, it's myself. But, or um, is it some, you know, someone else? my spouse, my, you know, my, my co-worker, my bot, you know, whomever, right? It, it, is that who you're seeking to find your help to get out of it? And God, you know, and, and Paul is saying, it was a point that, that it'd be better if, if, if we were dead. We could not handle this. But the purpose was to help us rely upon the God who raises the dead. And that's what we need to really, again, ask ourselves, evaluate it. Over and over again, am I functionally, am I actually, practically speaking, relying upon this God, or am I seeking something else to rely upon, to help me through it, to help me through whatever it is that I'm going through, right? And the way to do that, again, is, is going to him in prayer, relying on, I mean, that is the ultimate expression of saying, I'm not relying upon myself, I'm relying upon God, right? And, and, and you know, this is something like, you know, Sanjay and I have been sharing a lot of late where realizing um, we need to pray more. We need to pray more. And, and, and that's something I want to encourage all of you guys to really pray. And, and you know, one pastor was, was saying, you know what? Praying is one of the most difficult things. And I, I think I mentioned this, but praying is one of the most difficult things to do. And, and he said it's harder than preaching. Because when I start preaching, I think, I think I mentioned this, I don't know. When I start preaching, by the end of it, I can go 30, 40 minutes, and I'm still preaching. When I start with praying, two minutes in, I might be doing something else. I might be thinking about something else. I might be sleeping. I might be, well, he didn't say all these things, but um, I'm saying these things. Because <laughs> I find myself praying, you know, five minutes in, and suddenly I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about this, and, and I'm not praying anymore. Right? And, and, and something he was saying was, try praying for 20 minutes a day. Try praying 20 minutes a day. See how far you get. Do it for two weeks. And he said, but, I mean, his point was that there's, a, there's so much power behind praying that we don't, we, we don't take it very seriously. But he was saying, because it's so difficult, the idea of, of sitting down and praying for 20 minutes. You know, and, and, and there were some days where I was like, okay, I'm praying. I, I was able to do it for a couple of days, but then a couple of days afterwards, it's like, oh, you know, I was just trying to find the right moment. I was trying to find the right time. You know, I was making all sorts of excuses, and then the day's gone. 
then the next day is gone. And then the next day after that was gone. I was like, wait a minute. I haven't been doing it. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you realize. And, and even when you do do it, again, a couple minutes in, you're doing something else. Right? A Bible study, a lesson, you start, you know, you know, I'll finish it. But this, praying, it's hard. Because I think our hearts do not want to rely upon God. I think that's part of it. We just don't want to rely upon God. We just keep telling ourselves, I can do it. I'm going to figure it out. I know how it can get done. And that's the struggle, right? I mean, and, and that's why Jeremiah talks about the heart. Who can understand it? You can't understand it, right? And, and, and even though we say to ourselves, oh, I understand the heart. I understand what I'm about. I, I, you know, maybe, sort of, a little bit. But after something happens, you realize, oh, wait a minute. I didn't realize this. And, and it just opens a floodgate of, of oh, this is... I'm actually like this. You don't, you're, you're not what you thought maybe you were. Right? Um, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. I mean, a whole book about just how wicked the heart is. You know, I, that we don't really realize how bad the heart really can be. We don't really understand how bad we can actually get. And, and the ultimate way of expression of that, it's not a bad, like, evil wickedness per se, but it's this idea, God, I don't need you. I don't need you. I can do this. And I think that is the great challenge, right? The great challenge um, to make us rely not on ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead, right? So yes, the next time you're going through something hard, rather than saying to yourself, oh, God's not giving me more than I can handle. I can do it. No, it's okay to actually say, God, I can't handle this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm doing, and I am falling apart here. And Psalm 88 is actually a psalm that gives voice to that. And so, so that's partly why we're, we're going to look at Psalm 88 as well. Um, it gives voice, your, the ability to voice this dark, this dark sense. Um, and, and you'll notice the, the, the sermon is actually titled Christian Depression. I mean, is that even legitimate to say, Christian Depression? You know, because for a long time, you know, I, I probably would have been, you know, I was one of those people saying, nope, 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 nope. But actually, there's... there's, there's the Lord gives us Psalm 88 to help us voice some of that, right? To help us voice some of those frustrations. So, yes, um, if, if the next time you're going through something you can't handle, acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. There's no, it's, it's not sinful to acknowledge it. I can't do it, Lord. It's actually the point. And go to God. Go to him. I can't do it. Help. And this, this is where, hopefully, as we're building a sense of the church's community, where we're able to then come before one another and help one another in that regard. And being able to say, you need help, let me help. Right? And, and this is something I'm going to say, but as, as the hands, the feet, the body of Christ, right? that we would be that visual, visible expression of Christ to one another. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. And uh, again, as we think about uh, a little further... Um, the notion of uh, that you don't give us more than we can handle. Um, we see even Paul himself saying he couldn't handle it. Uh, Lord, so often we are in these situations, our circumstances, and immediately what we want to say is, no, I can handle it. And uh, we, at, we come to you to sort of supplement ourselves rather than completely unloading and saying, Lord, we can't do this. Um, your grace is sufficient. Uh, Lord, we... Um, Help us not to rely upon ourselves, but upon the God who raises the dead. Uh, and so, Lord, give us strength. Help us to really uh, consider and to think about what that means and uh, that we would enc encourage one another with words of wisdom, uh, that we might uh, direct one another towards you, O Christ, uh, in greater reliance, uh, functionally, uh, understanding that grace of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.